Hi everybody, welcome back. Uh, this week we're going to carry on with our discussion of sentencing and this was something that we started last week in week one and what I want to do today is go into a little bit more detail about some of the most current, most common types of sentencing structures that we use here in the United States at both the state and federal system, and that is determinate sentencing. So traditionally what we've seen in this country over the years is a heavy reliance on the use of indeterminate sentencing structures, but more recently we've made the switch in the conversion to determinate sentencing. So for those of you who are unfamiliar with these terms, let me break these down a little bit for you um, on more of a definitional level first. So to begin with, um, indeterminate sentencing structures refers to a type of criminal sentencing in which an offender is sentenced to a specific time period of incarceration. So for example, let's say that I got a DUI or a DWI, depending on, on where you live, um, but from that conviction, I was sentenced to two to five years. So that's a sentencing range of two to five years. Um, after the very first two years of incarceration, you have the opportunity under indeterminate sentencing structures uh, to be released on parole. It's not an absolute, but what it does guarantee is that you are eligible for a parole hearing at this time. If you were released, this would be considered discretionary parole. You serve two years in prison. You are released on discretionary parole. You, you serve the remaining um, three years out in the community living under parole supervision. If you were denied parole at this time, you could continue to serve uh, your incarceration sentence until the next opportunity for a parole hearing. And based on statutory outcomes for specific sentences, um, Really, there comes a point in time in which you would be, be mandatorily released on parole to, excuse me, finish out the remainder of that sentence based on the amount of time served and different things that the parole board would take into account. Mandatory parole normally um, would occur for those individuals who had some problem behaviors while they were incarcerated and then they had to spend more time um, in prison before they could be released out into the community. For the most part, this type of sentencing structure was used for for a long, long time at both the federal and state level. But in the 1980s, um, there were a series of high profile, very violent crimes that occurred in the country at the hands of parolees who were released under this indeterminate sentencing structure. And the crimes, because they were so violent and so startling at the time, um, really were used by state and federal politicians as a scapegoat or sort of a way to point the finger and for these politicians to say, well, see, we told you that offenders were no good. We told you that they couldn't be rehabilitated, but nobody listened to us and they got released and then they went out and they did all of these things. But lucky for you, we are here to protect you and the way that we can protect you. And of course, this argument meant set, made sense at the time because these high profile incidents that just happened. There was a high level of fear happening and surrounding these types of crimes. Nobody else wanted to be the victim of um, a violent parolee who got out and did something. Politicians were able to say, we'll protect you and the way in which we're going to protect you is by being tough on crime. If we put them away in prison for much longer, they cannot get out, they cannot hurt you, um, they wouldn't have the opportunity to be released early, and none of these things, or all of these things could have sort of been avoided. So using these as their scapegoat in 1984, um, Congress passes what they call the Sentencing Reform Act under the Reagan administration. And really what this, this legislation had was a two-part goal. First, um, the Sentencing Reform Act creates the United States Sentencing Commission at the federal level, and the United States Sentencing Commission, Commission is put in charge of creating statutory standards and min, ma, mandatory minimum sentencing for all federal crimes. So in essence, what the Sentencing Commission does is it creates formulas 
that take into account, these formulas are called the sentencing guidelines, and basically what the guidelines do is they take into account the crime that you had just committed, the circumstances surrounding the crime you just committed, um, so aggravating and mitigating circumstances. So for instance, um, perhaps you had multiple victims, perhaps the victims were part of a protected class, like the elderly, like minors, like police officers, whatever it is. Maybe you used a weapon, which is an aggravating circumstance. Um, <coughs> are there any mitigating circumstances that might come into play? For instance, are you personally a minor? Um, are you the victim of abuse? Things like that. So they take all those aggravating and mitigating circumstances into account. Um, the sentencing guidelines are going to look at things like your prior record, your family history, are you married, do you have a stable life, do you have children, all of those are positives in your, in your favor. Um, do you have employment history? Do you have ties to the surrounding area? They basically take an entire total inventory of your life up until the point that you committed the crime. And then once they take all of these things into account, a pre-sentence report is written by a probation officer. That probation officer then gives the recommendation to the judge for sentencing. And in essence, what this does is that it totally wipes out um, judicial discretion in terms of sentencing. So there's no longer a range. Um, what the sentence is, is you commit X, you get X number of years. Your sentence is no longer two to five years. It's just a blanket five. And that's it. So that's the first goal of the sentencing, of the Sentencing Reform Act. The second goal is the total elimination of parole at the federal level and the switch from indeterminate to a determinate sentencing structure. So like I said, there's no more two to five. It's just a blanket five years. That's a determinate sentencing structure. There's no more range. It's just one recommended year. So parole is eliminated at the federal level, and if you were um, convicted and sentenced of a crime after November 1st, 1987, parole is no longer an option for you. So parole does somewhat exist at the federal level for those long-termers who were convicted before November 1st, 1987, but essentially it is eliminated for everybody else moving forward. So at the federal, limit, federal level, at least, under the Sentencing Reform Act, inmates are going to serve at least 85% of their sentence. That's the new rule. Um, the other 15% comes from good time credits. So if you're behaving well in prison, you're not a problem child, you're not going to solitary confinement, um, you're not being written up, you don't have contraband, all of that stuff. If you are a model citizen while you're in prison, 15% of your sentence can be accrued with good time credits. However, it is legal and constitutional for those good time credits to be taken away for bad behavior. So potentially, if you were the worst inmate in the entire facility, you're always in trouble. Potentially, you could be serving the entire 100% of your determinate sentence. So if your de determinate sentence is five years, the earliest you could get out is after you serve 85% of that five-year sentence. Worst case scenario, you're being released on five years to the day. So that's what's happening at the federal level. Um, at the state level, it's a little bit different because, in essence, we have 50 different state governments. They all sort of do their own thing. Um, but for the most part, people are sort of uniform with one another. A lot of states really liked the idea of being tough on crime and introducing these determinate sentencing structures. So a lot of states have put them into place um, across the board. We're doing it for everybody. Other states have sort of said, well... I like that, but for the more violent offenders, I like that for the people that we want to go away for years, the murderers, the sex offenders, all these people, they should go away for years and years. Um, but some of the lower level, lower risk folks, maybe we'll still give them parole. So some individuals still have the opportunity for parole based on the type of offense. 
Um, and then other states still do parole across the board for everybody. So it's sort of a mixed bag. Um, but the general tendency is either to a total determinant sentencing structure or the eligibility of parole for very specific types of crimes. So um, sort of regardless of what states are individually doing, one constant theme seems to be true, and that is that prison sentences are getting longer and longer and longer, and people are going away for much more considerable lengths of time. Um, and almost to the point where I, th I feel like state and federal legislators have made it a point to implement reforms over the years that have just increased sentence lengths for almost every single type of crime. And mandatory minimum sentencing, um, things like three strikes legislation, if, you, if you're not familiar with that, it's basically three felonies and then you, um, on your third felony, you go to prison for life. And the total elimination of parole across the board has really just made prison sentences longer than they've ever been at any point in time. Um, and if offenders are sort of serving more time than they ever have in the past that's creating massive overcrowding problems. So we'll talk about that issue in just a second. Um, but one of the things in terms of sentencing that have had significant impacts, there's two areas. Um, both of these things we'll sort of talk about a little bit later on in the semester when we get to their specific weeks. Um, but when we're talking about sentencing specifically, there's these two areas that have been targeted um, that I want to highlight. I mean, there's been other things that have been increased monumentally, but I just want to talk about these two things here because I feel like it fits. Uh, so first, as we're talking about these longer and longer sentences, especially given the 1980s era, the feel, the movement of everything that came from, from the Reagan administration's um, sentence enhancements for drug users, especially if you look at um, Nancy Reagan's uh, campaign, Just Say No to Drugs, right? There was sort of this platform that ran throughout all parts of that administration and throughout the um, different Congresses during the Reagan administrations that really tried to go out of its way to focus and target um, drug users. And this is probably not by mistake because as we talked about in the last lect lecture, things really took off post-Vietnam. So if you think about the Vietnam era politics, you think about the culture, um, both socially, legally, politically, all of these things during that era was very pro, I don't want to say pro-drug, but drug-friendly. Um, counterculture was big into the drug movement. Many of the, the GIs that were coming back from Vietnam were coming back with substance issues because Southeast Asia had such a very, very large tie um, to especially the heroin drug industry. Um, we had so many GIs that were coming back with different drug problems that we went from a social climate that was very drug friendly to the total other extreme that really during the um, Nixon administration we see a clamp down on it but then during the Carter administration it becomes a little bit more um, not drug friendly but maybe we should just decriminalize instead of totally criminalizing and then after you get out of the democratic era with with Carter you go very much into a heavily right-wing conservative Reagan administration that clamps down on everything once again just like Nixon but takes it so much more further um, and takes it almost to the extreme in terms of what they're criminalizing. So when we talk about the expansions during the Reagan era war on drugs, um, you're seeing sentence enhancements for drug offenders, but what it really was geared towards was drug traffickers. But Based on the language of much of the legislation, it became an unintended consequence of the uh, of the letter, um, legislation rather to get the drug users. So people who even just had uh, personal use amounts of specific drugs were being put away in, in prisons for many years. 
um, which is sort of unfortunate because that's not what the intended consequence of that legislation was for. But nobody thought or desired to make the changes after sort of the wrongful implementation of those policies. So we'll get into that more when we talk about the war on drugs um, in a couple weeks here. But that was one of the massive areas for sentencing in which the enhancements really took off and had a strong, lasting, broad impact on the correctional system because of those mandatory minimums that were being put in place in the 80s for things like crack cocaine, but not necessarily powder, for marijuana, and then for some of the harsher um, street drugs that are out there. And I really think that this is um, an important and interesting conversation, and I really can't wait to get back into this more. Um, but if you think about the current climate that we have in this country, specifically focused on the legalization of recreational marijuana, there are people who are still in prison in Colorado for something that is completely and totally legal at this point, and that is just such a... <coughs> Excuse me... Really, it's a, it's a really interesting contradiction um, because, in particular, the Colorado laws were not retroactive. So how frustrating and pissed off must you be if you're currently sitting in a Colorado prison for something that is now legal and you can walk into a store to go get? Like, it must be just the most frustrating and, and, and angry thing that you could probably go through. So, I mean, recreational marijuana is one part of the conversation, but the other part that we'll have and we'll carry on is the idea of the opioid epidemic that's that's really sweeping this country, um, regardless of whether or not you're willing to acknowledge it as such as an opioid epidemic, it is happening, and it is an epidemic. Um, so we'll talk about the impacts that the war on drugs has had on creating these different um, epidemics over the different years and different time periods in this country. So that's one part of it um, in terms of sentencing where we've seen broad reaching impacts. And the other part of it goes forward about a decade into the 1990s um, in which we saw shortly in the late in the late 1980s, very, very early 1990s, like 91, 92, um, we're seeing sort of not a huge spike, but a, a little bit of a temporal spike in terms of the crime rate going up slightly for violent and sexual based crimes. And it, again, sort of caused a little bit of fear, a little bit of panic among communities that legislatures, uh, legislators jumped on again. And we saw sentencing enhancements happen in the early 1990s for these violent and, and sexual based crimes. And really when we're talking about sex crimes in the early 1990s, you cannot exclude the idea of the sex offender registry from that conversation. Sex offenders have largely been a boogeyman type of offender group in this country for a while, but it really, really took root in the early 1990s. Um, 1994 is when we see the first federal pieces of legislation that go into, a play, into place that establish and expand um, the modern sex offender registry. So the early 1990s serve as this huge turning point for sexually based offenses. Um, and even today, we see many sex crimes, many of those offenders receiving longer prison sentences for violent offenses that are not sexually based, but are still brutally violent. And when you do get out of prison, or once you are convicted, post-conviction rather, um, sex offenders face something that no offender, uh, no other offender group has to face, and that is the idea of publicly available registry. So when you get out of prison, you then have to register with the state, and all of your information is out there for the world to see. And many times in many states, and Texas is one of them, um, registration is for life. So you're not even incarcerated for life, but you're on the registry for life trying to make a life for yourself in the community trying to battle the stigma of the registry and like I said no other group has publicly available is on a publicly available um, registry website for all offenders in all states so when we're talking about the registry you're talking about a duration uh, of time that might have you on there for the 
majority, if not the rest of your life, but it's technically not a punishment and it's technically not a sentence. Um, in 2003, in the Smith v. Doe Supreme Court case, um, SCOTUS actually rules and they say, well, I hear your argument about it being a punishment. I hear your argument that it feels like a sentence, but actually the sex offender registry is a, is a public safety tool and therefore your placement on the registry is not a punishment, but it is a civil appointment. Um, so it's a civil placement rather than a criminal sanction. It feels the exact same if you are on the registry and you talk to a sex offender. I am being punished for the rest of my life for something that might have happened, you know, one time with my girlfriend who happened to be underage, but now I'm being punished for the rest of my life, right? But according to the courts, it is a civil placement rather than a criminal placement sanction um so it's a little bit different but it's wrapped up in this conversation of criminal sanctioning and sentencing nonetheless and it's part of the sentence enhancement thing that we talked about a little earlier so we have these different things going on but sort of wrapping back to this idea of the sentencing commission and the sentencing guidelines it's taking discretion away from judges so in 2005 um, SCOTUS rules in Booker v United States that no longer um, that judges no longer have to abide by the sentencing guidelines to a T. They are now considered to be recommended and uh, recommended guidelines, but they are not mandatory for judges to use anymore. However, if the sentence is X, you cannot go extreme above and beyond. You have to stay somewhere within there for the appeals purposes, but it's not mandatory that you abide by it to a T. So for example, let's say that the rec recommended sentence is between five and seven years. Before, while the sentencing guidelines were mandatory in use, um, the judge had to sentence the offender to five, six, or seven years. They couldn't deviate from that. Um, after the Booker case, now judges can, can move around and there's a little bit more discretion. Um, and legally, you could give whatever sentence you wanted, but having that sentence upheld is a different story. So normally if you had a five to seven year recommended prison sentence, you could probably get okay, be okay with three and a half, four years, um, four and a half, five, you'd be okay anywhere there. And then on the other end with the recommended tight end or high end of seven years, you'd probably be okay with seven and a half, eight years, maybe even nine years, but that might be pushing it, right? Um, but the idea is, is that you can't radically go in a different direction. And if the high end is seven, you can't give somebody 12 years, 14 years, 15 years, 20 years. This is a life sentence, right? You can't go to that extreme. And then on the other end, you really can't say, well, if it's a recommended minimum of five years, I'm just gonna give this guy probation, right? It's not, I mean, legally you can, but will that hold up on appeal? Probably not. So any deviation from the recommended sentence guideline um, really needs to be justified and based on some sort of legal rationale in order for that sentence to be hold up, held up on appeal. I mean, legally you can do it if you wanted to, but the state might come back, the defendant might come back, and that sentence is probably just going to be thrown out anyway. So, I mean, regardless of how we're getting there, whether a judge is using some sort of discretion, they're holding up the, the federal sentencing guidelines to a T, um, or they're, they're working on the state system, the bottom line is that we are ending up with longer prison sentences that are being implemented on offenders who are spending just significant amounts of time in prison for years and years. And... If you can imagine that prison sentences are getting longer, there is probably getting less, there's there's less and less room within prisons. And, excuse me, very quickly what we saw was that prisons and jails were becoming just extremely overcrowded. And this is a consistent issue that has been happening for the last 30 plus years in which we see incarceration rates just increasing, increasing, increasing. Um, but the crime rate is just 
consistently decreasing. We're seeing an, a, a total inverse relationship happening for pretty much the aggregate of all offenses. There might be some deviation there in terms of the specific um, type of crime, but for oh, overall, the crime rate is going down while the incarceration rate is going up. And that inverse relationship is happening because of these sentencing structures that are, are, are being put in place at the state and federal level. Inmates are arriving, but they're not leaving. And when people just keep coming and coming and coming and nobody's vacating, very quickly what you have is no room at the inn. So what do you do then? And there's a few options. You got to build more prisons, right? But prisons cost money. You need staff to be able to supervise an incarcerated population. Second, I guess you could you could go out to a private prison. Private prisons are for profit. You know what happens if you have a for-profit institution? They need to make money, and when you make when you're trying to make money, you need to run your cost margin down as low as you can get it. And when you're trying to keep your cost margin down, you're cutting corners. So there's less staff, um, there's less resources, uh, all kinds of different things, right? That's not the best option. Many people do not advocate for the use, the continued use of private prisons, but they still exist. It's an option, right? Um, third, you have the occurrence of mass blanket releases. That happens every so often in which they need to vacate um, you know, a variety of different beds. So you'll see low-level, non-violent drug offenders predominantly being released in mass waves. And normally, I mean, these, these inmates that they're releasing are maybe one to two years away from being released anyway, so it's not that big of a deal. But then everybody's going into panic that these mass waves of inmates are coming out. But hundreds of thousands of people get released from prison every year, so what, what, what does it matter if they're all being released on the same day? But it's an option, right? You need beds. I'll move the bodies out so I can get new bodies in. And then finally, there's one more option. And I mean, personally, I think it's the most financially sound. It's the smartest. It's the most reasonable option. But nobody ever wants to seem to take this. And that's just, let's go back to indeterminate sentencing. We realize that determinate and truth in sentencing isn't effective. It's not working. And it's keeping people in for much longer than they need to be in. So let's go back to the old system. Let's go back to indeterminate sentencing structures where you can have people be released on parole. It's cheaper to supervise them while on parole than it is while they're incarcerated anyway. And if you do provide them the time and resources for re-entry, they normally do pretty good. When you leave them out on the streets for them to fend for themselves, that's when they have problems. But if you can help guide them in the re-entry effort, it, it helps keep them from recidivating and going back in, which also saves money. Um, so if you're having a problem with the sentencing structure, instead of trying to find ways to alleviate that overcrowding, why don't you just change the sentencing structure? I mean, that seems pretty logical to me, but then it makes us appear as though we're weak on crime, and that's political suicide. So we can't do that. Uh, so, I mean, you sort of go round and round in this conversation, it becomes quite frustrating because you know what the solution is, but nobody's going to be willing enough to, to say, yeah, I want prisoners to spend less time incarcerated because then they'll never get elected again. So it's, it's a hard fight to fight. I have no problem saying it because I'm not up for election or anything. Um, but if you are, you're sort of in this boat in which you don't want to rock too much. But we're creating a system, once again, and that's pretty much a consistent theme throughout this class, we're creating a system in which people are set up to fail, and then we're just shocked when they fail. <coughs> <coughs> but at least we feel good about it because we're trying to do something to corral the problem. So um, on that happy note, <laughs> I guess let's save the rest of that conversation for a different day when we get into reentry and stuff like that. Um, but next week, we're going to jump in the facilities. So we focus on sentencing. You now got your prison, your, your incarceration sentence, and now you're going to go in the facility. So next week, um, what I want us to do is spend a little bit of time talking about jails. It's pretty much going to be the only week in which we talk about jails because there are so many more people who are incarcerated in prisons compared to um, short-term short facilities like jails, 
but they serve an important purpose and they do more than just incarcerate short-termers. Um, so I want us to spend a little bit of time talking about these important facilities and their role in the general correctional system. Um, so let's do that next week and I'll let you guys go right now. Thank you for your time and for listening to me go off on my soapbox a little bit. Um, but that's, that's what we do here. We talk about problems and we try and find solutions. So sometimes that involves a little bit more discussion. So next week we'll talk about jails. Meet me back here next time. We'll talk about that. And I hope you guys have a great rest of your day. I hope you have a great rest of your week. And I will see you guys next time. Thanks, guys. Have a good one. Thanks. Bye.